a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you, says the Lord. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Welcome to St. John's. It is great to see you. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you today to celebrate the life and ongoing life of Fred Harvey. As most of you are aware, um, you can wear masks. It's not mandatory, but we strongly encourage it. We will have a reception out following um, the, the worship service um, out on the patio, and we'll go out. Um, the family can go out first and then um, go one row at a time and then just keep on going. Don't stop in the narthex. Um, let's get everybody outside where there's fresh air. Um, before we stop and talk. You can turn down the ringer on your cell phone. And tomorrow's Palm Sunday. It's going to be awesome here at St. John's, 10 o'clock, if you are um, open and available. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of all those who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who now rest from their labor. We praise you for those dear to us who we name in our hearts before you now. Especially we thank you for Fred, whom you have now received into your presence. Help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years. Bring us at last with all your saints, into the joy of your home, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and mind, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. For everything, there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to reap what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time for love and a time for hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Wizard of Oz, excerpt from chapter 23, The Good Witch Grants Dorothy's Wish. What can I do for you, my child? Glinda asked. Dorothy told the witch all her story, how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she had found her companions, and of the wonderful adventures they had met with. My greatest wish now, she added, is to get back to Kansas, for Aunt Anne will surely think something dreadful has happened to me. Glinda leaned forward and kissed the sweet upturned face of the living little girl. Bless your dear heart, she said. I am sure I can tell you of a way to get back to Kansas. Your silver shoes will carry you over the desert, replied Glinda. If you had known their power, you could have gone back to your Aunt Em the very first day you came to this country. But then I should not have had my wonderful brains, cried the scarecrow. And I should not have had my lovely heart, said the tin woodman. And I should have lived a coward forever, declared the lion. This is all true, said Dorothy. And I am glad I was of use to these good friends. But now that each of them has had what he most desired and each is happy in having a kingdom to rule besides, I think I should like to go back to Kansas. The silver shoes, said the good witch, have wonderful powers. All you have to do is knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to carry you wherever you wish to go. If that is so, said the child joyfully, I will ask them to carry me back to Kansas at once. Glinda the Good stepped down from her ruby throne to give the little girl a goodbye kiss, and Dorothy thanked her for all the kindness she had shown to her friends and herself. Dorothy now took Toto up solemnly in her arms, and having said one last goodbye, she clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, Take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly, she was whirling through the air so swiftly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. Good gracious, she cried where she was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie and just before her was the new farmhouse Uncle Henry built after the cyclone had carried away the old one. Dorothy stood up and found she was in her stocking feet for the silver shoes had fallen off in her flight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. Aunt Em had just come out of the house to water the cabbages when she looked up and saw Dorothy running toward her. My darling child, she cried, where in the world did you come from? From the land of Oz, said Dorothy gravely, and here is Toto too. 
And oh, and am I'm so glad to be at home again. Hello, everyone. Um, on behalf of the family, let me first thank you all uh, for being here. Um, I'm, uh, I had a, I've, I've been thinking about what I would say for a while now, um, since his passing, and I, I had a lot of things written um, a few weeks ago, basically a couple days ago, I, I wasn't happy with that, kind of threw it all out, so I took a different approach. So let me apologize up front 
Um, this is clearly a very solemn occasion, and I'm going to go a little lighter, I think, in some of my comments here today. Um, so please bear with me. I hope you'll enjoy uh, some of my thoughts here. Um, so some of you that don't know my dad very well may be wondering why we've been uh, reading things from The Wizard of Oz and uh, having that beautiful uh, um, Somewhere of the Rainbow song. Uh, my dad, uh, at a, in his formative years, back when he was in his, you know, very young, you know, in, in his early teens or younger, um, he was a big fan of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, and uh, he read the entire collection of Oz books uh, written by Frank Baum. Um, and let me give a little bit of background um, for those of you who are younger, if you're, you know, maybe less than 90, this may not all be familiar to you. Um, the Wizard of Oz, uh, and I had to look all, a lot of this up to, to, to speak today. Uh, the Wizard of Oz itself was the first book in a series. It was published in 1900. Um, there were 14 books written by, uh, by L. Frank Baum between, and published between 1900 and 1920. And again, Fred read, read all of them and had copies of all of them, and we still have those copies. Um, there was also a whole, um, uh, there were a lot other Oz books written by other authors and other things. It's a whole uh, franchise, if you will, of, of, of Oz material from that era. Um, and again, for the younger, this is basically the equivalent of the 19, early 1900s of what Star Wars or the Marvel Universe or Harry Potter uh, would be today. Um, I was asking, you know, how many, how many Oz movies were made and, you know, not nearly as many if, if the Oz books had come out today, we might have 20 or 30 Oz movies rather than just a few. Um, additional, so in, in relating the Oz books to some of the modern, uh, more modern things, um, you know, one thing I remember was that one of some of these new modern classics uh, like, like, this, like Star Trek and, and Harry Potter and things came out, my dad was like, you know, this, you know these aren't that original. And he, he saw a lot of, um, you know, when he saw Star Wars, he was like, you know, a lot of this is a ripoff from, 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 from Baum and, and Oz. And, and I, I don't want to go into too much detail, but for example, um, uh, in the reading, we heard about um, uh, uh, Dorothy and her, she was raised, as you, many of you may recall, by her Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. Well, if you go to the very first scenes of Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, um, who was he raised by? Anybody have any recollection? I'm looking, yeah. Um, he was raised by his aunt and uncle, Aunt Beru uh, and Uncle M. You know, clearly a ripoff of, uh, of, of, Frank, uh, of Frank Baum. Um, they were also farmers on, uh, in Kansas. His, his aunt and uncle were farmers and it was a very a farming thing. And his aunt and uncle, aunt and uncle were, were, they were moisture farmers on the uh, desert island of Tatooine, for those of you that are, um, remembering that. So, um, so again, sticking with this, this scene is I was thinking of how, and I wanted to talk about his involvement in the community and I was figuring out, you know, how can I, um, you know, present this to you in a, in an entertaining way. Um, so I thought I would ask by asking you a question um, and relate it to sort of, you know, my life. I'm from San Diego where, where the Comic Con conventions occur. Well, not recently, but annually the Comic Con conventions are there. And I thought I'd ask the question for you to think about um, if my dad were a young man today and he decided to attend Comic-Con um, as an Oz character, um, what Oz character would he choose? Okay, so, you know, I'll give you a few seconds. Think about, you know, what Oz character would best fit for, for my dad if he were to dress up and attend the, uh, the Comic-Con convention. So all of you have picked a, an Oz character. Well, okay, that's... You okay? Let me. I have my thoughts, but I'll, so my first, my first one. Would he go as the scarecrow? And as we heard in the reading, uh, the scarecrow, you know, was a man with a with a with a, who had a brain and was, uh, and my dad clearly had a brain, and uh, very smart guy. And as an aside, when we were getting ready to talk about this, my sister said, "I I really shouldn't cover anything that has been covered in his obituary." So I can't talk about him being Phi Beta Kappa. I can't mention that. Um, or graduating for Bullet Hall Law School. I, I can't say anything. That's in the back of your program and you can read about it there. So what I did find to show how smart he is or smart he was throughout his life, when he was in high school, and Ann, I don't know if you remember this, he won first prize in the San Francisco zone 
of the Lions Club's ninth annual student speaking contest, probably 1945 or 46. And I just found this out yesterday. I have a newspaper clipping about it. And I didn't know about this. But what I, what I found was extremely topical was that in the paper, it said the topic that he spoke on or that it, he spoke on was my responsibility as a young American to lasting world peace. So I just thought that was very, uh, very apropos for, uh, for where we are today in the world, that even back in the 40s, uh, Fred was speaking and winning awards for speaking about uh, world, world peace. So would he go as the scarecrow? So you can imagine him dressing up as the scarecrow. Maybe the Tin Woodman. How many people thought the Tin Woodman? Ah, somebody, okay. So like the Tin Woodman, Fred had the lovely heart and he cared deeply about, about the environment. And I thought I'd just give one example of um, that many of you, some of you may not be familiar with, but I, you know, nearby here is, is Willard Park, um, which is near the middle school that um, I and my siblings attended. Um, but Willard Park was not there when they first moved to this community. It was established in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, there were houses there. Uh, before that, and my father uh, was involved with the planning, design, and development of Willard Park. Um, and uh, it was a pretty controversial with tearing out a bunch of houses. I can't imagine going in and basically clearing a, 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 a fairly large size city block today. I uh, can't imagine all the lawsuits that, uh, that would happen. Um, but they managed to do that in, in uh, round 69. Uh, this was also a very turbulent time in Berkeley. Uh, back in the 60s, um, and uh, all the houses were moved or taken down, um, and uh, they created this beautiful park, and a essentially all of the do design elements that I remember him working through and trying to figure out, you know, there were a lot of conflicting parties, how many tennis lots, tennis, uh, tennis courts do you have, how much space do you have for play equipment, um, that's all pretty much still there. Um, so maybe he would go as the Tin Woodsman and, um, and, and go in that uh, kind of a mode. I also thought, how many thought of Dorothy when you thought of Fred dressing up and going? Yes, very much so. Um, he would not have been concerned about the cross-gender dressing. He would have, uh, I think, gra uh, gravitated possibly to that. Um, and I was trying to relate how, you know, how does Fred and Dorothy relate? So let me just... Now, let me go back to the, the very start of the movie um, when uh, Dorothy falls from the sky and, and lands in, in Munchkin land, or in the book, it's referred to as Munchkin country. And a little bit more background, Munchkin country is the eastern quadrant of the land of Oz. Uh, it's populate, populated mainly by Munchkins who were enslaved by the Wicked Witch until Dorothy's house descended and landed, killing, landed on the witch, witch, killing her instantly leaving her behind, leaving behind her magic shoes, which in the book are referred to as the, uh, the silver, silver shoes. And um, Dorothy was a great hero to the Munchkins and uh, celebrated for her and awarded the shoes. Um, my dad, a, a, a related, and this might be a stretch, but bear with me, um, the Munchkin country for my dad, I, in my view now today, was the Elma di District, which is the community nearby here where he had his law office and where he was very active. And our, and our family was basically, our home was in the general Elmwood area. In approximately 1988, there was a fire in a building next to the Elmwood Theater, which was a single theater, single um, screen theater uh, that had been there since the, I think the 1900s. And this, the theater suddenly had to close because of this fire that had been damage in the, um, had, had basically impacted the theater. The merchants, who you might think of as the munchkins in this, in this context, um, I, I apologize if there are any merchants from the Elma district uh, here. Um, they were significantly impacted by this. And I didn't make this connection until I read uh, one of the reports about this. Uh, they, they, you know, the, the theater brought in a lot of traffic and the, that traffic would then be people that would have dinner and shop in the evenings. And they saw that there was a tremendous drop off in, in evening traffic and the merchants were impacted. Um, and there was documentation of this. The, uh, the Wells Fargo there provided documentation that saw their ATM withdrawals were dropping significantly after the fire in comparison to their withdrawals from before the fire. And I have all this data. Um, he didn't throw anything away, so it's all there. Um, but he worked with the, the merchants and they set up um, a group to an organization to restore the theater 
Um, they secured a loan, purchased the theater through that organization. They renovated it, uh, converted it into a single, from a single theater to a triplex, uh, splitting the balcony into two theaters. Um, and after reopening, it brought, um, brought foot traffic back to the Elma District. And the merchants, munchkins, if you will, were all very excited and happy and, um, and celebrated this. The final thought here is that, and this is something I didn't fully appreciate until just talking about it the other day. He, he was awarded for all this effort. He got a free pass to the Elmwood Theater that he could use to go attend movies. And this was the, you know, his equivalent in this context of the Silver Shoes, um, this award, what he had been awarded by the, um, uh, by the Munchkins or the Merchants for his, for his contribution to, uh, to Munchkin Land or the, uh, or the Elma District. Um, and just if you're looking for something to do after the, after the show today, after this show today, um, at that theater, Sonic the Hedgehog is playing at 345, Coda at 4, and West Side Story at, at 420. So um, just walk down and, 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 out of, and attend. Um, I could go on and talk about how he might be Glinda the Good Witch, um, maybe the wizard. Um, but I'll let you continue all of this. I've, I'm waiting for Bill to start playing me off because I've gone over, over time. But, um, but in, in sort of in closing, you know, I, I think there are a lot of all these characters in Fred, and that was was very much a part of him. Um, those that was, you know, he he was it was a big, very very big part of him as he was growing and developing as a young man, and he really embraced a lot of the things that he learned there. Um, and you know, in the future, I will remember Fred. Always, and especially when I when I drive by uh, the Willard Park or any park, I'll think of him uh, in that context. Every annually, um, when the Comic Con uh, occurs in San Diego, and I see the news coverage of these people uh, dressed up in, in various different uh, uh, things, I will always think of my of my father and the, the great person that he was. So, I'll leave it that at that. Thank you very much. My name is Fred Goff. I'm a member of St. John's and Bill Harvey asked if I could say something about my experience with his parents uh, at St. John's, particularly in the early years. Shortly after Fred and Marietta were married in 1957 and they moved to Berkeley, they joined St. John's. And I, say, I joined St. John's in that same year. They were in their late 20s and I was 14 in the ninth grade at Willard Junior High School. My parents were Presbyterian missionaries to Columbia, South America, and were on a one-year furlough here in Berkeley. And we lived at the Berkeley Presbyterian Mission Homes, near where Fred later lived, right there on uh, Regent Street, just a couple of blocks from St. John's, and I joined Troop 4. Fred and Mary had volunteered to lead the junior high group that met in the old St. John's building that's now the uh, Julia Morgan Theater. And one evening, one of the main events was a dance. I told Fred that I was not allowed to dance. And I didn't know how to dance. And that I had even ridden my bike up into the uplands where my friends would go to take a class in how to dance. He confidently told me not to worry. Just do what comes naturally. So when the music started, I paired off with Millie Rhodes, and that's what I did. But shortly after, 
Fred came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said softly, not so close. And that, that memorable incident was emblematic of his practice throughout his long years of tenure with the collaboration of Kathy Pratt and Don Rising as creator and coordinator of scores of pageants, camps, skits, Easter egg hunts, Halloween horror chambers, and a host of other productions. There were four constants in addition to having fun. Those constants were one, inclusivity regardless of ability or background. Two, collaborative creativity. Three, freedom and risk-taking within limits. All wrapped up in the confidence that whatever happened, everything would work out no matter what. One of the hallmarks of his productions was the added suspense and tension within the audience as they wondered how this could all possibly come together, which it always did. 55 years after meeting Fred and Marietta, I began convening a men's breakfast where Fred's was a faithful member for over 10 years. And in that group, we sought to apply the lessons that he taught. Thanks be to God for the gift of Fred's life and for his ministry among us. Amen. Hello, my name is uh, William Harvey. I'm Fred's younger son. The family. Anyway, Fred showed up. When I started to play trumpet, elementary school and through junior high school, Fred would show up to all my stuff. It was normal and expected and the standard for this area, unless it was right here. I needed help, a little help uh, getting to and from. Later on in high school, um, we had band concerts and our jazz ensemble worked a little harder. We usually played a concert every month. My parents would show up to every single show. But the other guys in the band, their parents would show up sometimes and other, other guys' parents, not at all. Um, and then I felt a little bit different when I saw some of my friends, they, got, they went out to go carousing after the show and I would get back into the family car. I look over there, hmm, when, maybe I could do that sometime, but not now. When I went to college, I lived at home, I commuted to San Francisco State. Um, Fred and Marietta, they, they, they would go to my shows if I said they were good and it was worth going to. Um, you know, they, they would talk to my friends, they'd get to know them, they knew what instrument they played, they knew their names. And then one, one day I'm sitting outside the building, where people would sit and smoke cigarettes and eat. And somebody said, Bill, 
you have really cool parents. I said, I have cool parents. Why are my parents cool? And somebody said to me, you are so lucky that you have parents who are supportive. And then following up on that, I found out that probably most of the other music students had parents that didn't want them to study music. And I actually knew some people, it was a handful, whose parents didn't even want them to go to college. Coming from this community, I'd never heard of such a thing. And here I was working shoulder to shoulder with people who actually rebelled against their parents to do what was supported and expected in my own household. I'm going to jump up a bit. Um, after working outside the area, leaving the state of California and, 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 and working outside the United States, um, I came back here to freelance on my trumpet. And every fall, I would go out on a, on a tour with an opera company. And uh, we would meet at the San Francisco airport. And then we'd fly back in after a few weeks or a month and a month and a half, whatever it was. It was always different. But we always we, we'd get, have to figure out how to get to the airport. It was usually San Francisco. Um, and, and Bart didn't, didn't go there yet, so it's a little complicated. So um, my mom usually had time to drop me off. She could, and sometimes she could pick me up. And, and she would actually come into the airport and she would talk to my friends. Meanwhile, especially um, at the end of the tour, uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses would, would come to pick up uh, my coworkers, sometimes with flowers, uh, public displays of affection, and here's my mom talking to everybody. But then I noticed there was, there was another one of my coworkers whose parents would go to the airport. Um, this coworker wouldn't tell her parents when she was flying in or out, but they would figure it out and they would show up anyway. This was a violinist and she's sitting right there and I married her. We liked each other and we accepted each other because we have parents that are involved in our lives and are very present. Um, Fred showed up to work. I was just, I was just talking to Ira Meyer out on the patio on the way in, and uh, Fred had no concept of retirement. He thought it was very important that he show up and keep showing up. He would show up to work for his clients, who were all sorts of people in our community and he would do it for himself. He would show up to church every Sunday and he was always on a committee or two. And he, and he did the camp, you know, that started when he was 65. He would show up to the full meetings of the Berkeley Democratic Club and he was also on the executive board that club was nice enough to put their board meetings, um, schedule their board meetings to meet at Fred's house. So that was one less ride that he, he needed. By the way, anybody ever gave a ride to Fred? Thank you very much. I give people rides now. Um, so 
he he insisted on 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 serving his community and interacting with people and being with his friends and colleagues and, and people who were interested and in favor of the same stuff that he was in as long as he could, no matter how inconvenient it was. He could have just stayed home and watched TV. Who knows how long he would have made it. Anyway, I will never be exactly like Fred. I'm just not. But we can try to emulate his loyalty, commitment, and love. And we can do that by showing up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Andre Lyle Pincus, and I'm lucky to be one of Fred's many grandchildren. I normally don't introduce myself by my full name, but I think it's important to point out that one thing my grandfather and I will always share, even after death, is our middle name, Lyle. To be named after Fred is an honor that I get to carry with me for the rest of my life. <laughs> But the bond Fred and I shared goes beyond our middle names. Ever since I can remember, I would at least once a year fly across the country from Maryland to stay with my grandparents in Berkeley. In fact, 2020 was the first year of my life, besides the first, because I was in Russia, uh, that I didn't go to California to see my grandpa. For my entire life, Fred and Marietta opened up their home to me and my siblings. Fred would greet me by saying, now I'm supposed to ask how your flight was. That's a thing you do when people fly. And if we got in late, Grandma Marietta would be making some split pea soup for us in the kitchen or something like that. It was always different and yet it was always the same. And the familiarity of those California visits, the smells, exploring every nook and corner of that house and the love that only grandparents can give is what comforted me. Memories of driving up to swim at the club on the hill, petting Duke and chasing down Earl in the backyard sun, digging the rocks from the gravel driveway out of our feet, climbing the chimney and the back porch and the cottage and the roof. We did a lot of climbing back then. Um, doing the jumble with Fred over orange slices at breakfast, family dinners and game nights on the back deck. I could go on and on and on with memories of that Berkeley house. The love Fred had for that house was passed into all of us. It was a haven of happiness for me and my siblings, something we will always cherish. There's another thing Fred and I shared, and that was our love for Camp Elmwood. As most of you know, Fred founded Camp Elmwood 30 years ago and ran it for many years after that. At age 65, when many people may find themselves counting the days to retirement, if they weren't retired already, Fred was still creating legacies and changing lives. When I asked him about Camp Elmwood's origin story a few years back, Fred said he wanted to create a camp that taught kids good values. That's why it was named after the neighborhood. It wasn't a sports camp, it wasn't a religious camp, it wasn't a music camp. His vision for Camp Elmwood was to be an ethics camp where children could learn to be kind and contributing citizens of this world, came alive here at St. John's, where we're all gathered. Now, anybody here who has been part of Camp Elmwood knows that it's special. You can just feel it. Part of that was thanks to the traditions that Fred created. From the Teen Leadership Week, which was established by my cousin Sabrina, to the annual trek to Lake Temescal, to the talent show and barbecue dinner, to the trash cleanups at Pacifica Beach, to the theme that would change every year, themes like love, kindness, patience. Once more, the list goes on. Besides the traditions, it was also Fred's character at the core of the camp that made it special. 
Most of you are likely aware how ridiculously expensive summer camps can be nowadays. Hundreds of dollars a week for each kid, not Camp Elmwood. Camp Elmwood always had a notably low price for attendance, almost nothing. And then on top of that, Fred offered a scholarship for any family who didn't feel comfortable paying the full price. That was just how he did things. He was fair and ethical and had a strong sense of right and wrong. Because Camp Elmwood was founded on values like these, they permeated through the camp's atmosphere. Even as a kid, you just knew it was a good place to be. Camp Elmwood was a space for children to grow and learn and play and laugh and dance and eat watermelon and smile and love. It was a place for making music and practicing passions, for performing and drawing and throwing and singing and reading and connecting. It was everything a child could want it to be. And the teen leaders knew how to have fun too. I loved being a counselor at Camp Elmwood, especially when Fred was still in charge. Sometimes the rules would get a little lax and that was, that was okay. He just wanted everyone to be happy and we were. I made such close connections with the other counselors I worked with. I'm grateful to still be in touch with many of them today and we're still a Camp Elmwood family. It's not just because we went to summer camp together. I've been to plenty of other camps that I haven't walked away from with lifelong friends. It was because we went to Camp Elmwood. That was the power of it. That was the power of Fred's creation. When Fred passed, I shared the news with many of these old friends, now young adults scattered across the country. Each one expressed their deepest condolences and sympathies. But beyond that, they shared with me just how much Fred and Camp Elmwood meant to them. They told me what an inspiration Fred was and the impact Camp Elmwood had on their lives. Fred shaped hundreds of childhoods, and I truly believe that he had a positive impact on each person who participated, whether it was for one, five, or 10 summers, whether it was as a camper, counselor, director, volunteer, or even a parent. Fred created a legacy and I was honored to be a part of it for as long as I was. I know that as long as Camp Elmwood continues to run, he will be making an impact on the world. I'm gonna miss you, Grandpa. But I'll always have these parts of you with me. We'll always share these things. To, to use a quote Fred would often recite when telling us goodbye, good night, good luck, and may the good Lord take a liking to you. Thank you. So thank you all for joining us here today, both in person and on Zoom, um, as we are here to celebrate the life of our father, Frederick L. Harvey. So I'm Ruth Harvey. I'm Fred's oldest child. I'm the lawyer and the one who lives furthest away in Maryland. I'm also Andre's mom. Um, and also the mom of Alex, Lizzie, and Cameron, and Ben is there too, he's my son-in-law. So I'm very blessed to have such a wonderful family uh, here with us today. Um, but all of you, the rest of you who are here, I want you to know that my father treasured each and every one of you. He loved his family, he loved his community at St. John's, his friends, colleagues, and clients, and all of you who considered him to be a teacher, mentor, or coach. So one thing that we found as we have been going through his house the last couple of months is that he saved, and it seems, it feels like file cabinets full of uh, holiday cards, thank you cards, pictures drawn by children, um, every note that expressed appreciation. He treasured all of that and, um, and, saved, and saved it. Um, so thank you all for um, sending him those notes. He was a quiet person and generally 
he didn't give big hugs, right? Um, but his birthday parties and other events he had expressed his fondness for all of you. Um, many of you here probably either attended his 80th or 90th birthday parties. And um, Max and I were talking about that yesterday and Max thought that, you know, the family thought he should have an 80th birthday party, but uh, no. <laughs> um, his, his 80th birthday party, which was also his semi-retirement party, um, was his way of, uh, and, and I will say he spent months and months seeking out, you know, every person who had touched his life, starting, you know, in elementary school, up through high school, college, his career, some of his favorite clients and beyond. Um, but that was his way of thanking everyone uh, who touched his life. So just a few things about my dad and my relationship with him. So one, and, and Dan mentioned this, he had a quick mind and also he was a strategic thinker. So he always beat me at Monopoly. And even at about the age of 91, he crushed me in charades. Um, another thing about my dad is that he loved the outdoors and an adventure. So for example, when we were eight years, when I was eight years old, I guess Dan was seven and Bill was three, our family of five drove a Volkswagen bus from Berkeley to Montreal we drove 500 miles a day, then we pitched a tent in a different state in each, uh, each night, all so that we could visit Canada and experience a World's Fair. And if you've um, read the obituary that's on the back of the program or read another one, you would know that a World's Fair is something that was incredibly um, meaningful and important to him. Um, and then later, as I had my own adventures, he also was eager to visit and explore. And whether I was in Michigan for law school or Oregon working for a judge, in Germany teaching English, in DC where I landed at the Justice Department, or finally in Maryland, he, he and my mother were always eager to visit and uh, spend that time with us. So although my dad was happy or at least accepted it, that it was time for me to launch and have my own adventures when I turned 18. And I have to say, he was also excited that he could have his own new adventures after the three of us left the house. Um, there's no reason, I mean, it's pretty clear why he didn't start Camp Elmwood until he was 65. He needed to have us, you know, gone. Um, but he was also, in terms of me leaving, he was also very strategic in thinking about how to handle my, my departure. He applauded my successes, but he simultaneously always made sure that I knew I had a, a place back at home. So I traveled the world for a few years, and then I decided to go to law school. And I think he was the only one who wasn't surprised by that decision. Um, he loved practicing law on his own. And as many of you know, he liked to do things his way. And he was also willing to do the work behind the scenes to get things done. So for that reason, a solo law practice was the right thing for him. So, but although he loved that solo law practice, he liked making all those choices himself he did say many, many times that he would be happy to have me join his solo law firm. And he said that he would even change the name from Frederick L. Harvey Attorney at Law, that was the name of the firm, to Harvey and Father. <laughs> so I never took him up on that offer but I did enjoy hearing about his cases, of course, without him divulging any privileged or confidential information. Um, and also I enjoyed hearing about all the challenging problems he was trying to 
help his clients resolve. Another place for him to use his skills at strategic thinking, but also um, listening and empathy, which were um, skills that he had as well. Um, I also occasionally called him on him for help uh, when I had a questions about the in intricacies of California property law uh, that only rarely, but came up in my practice, but then I really needed help. Um, so, but my dad's strategic thinking and patience paid off because then when I married Larry and within just a couple of years, we were raising four children. I, I knew that even though I had been out and exploring the world all those years, I knew that my dad and my mom would play a big role in, in our family. Um, you know, and Andre just talked about that. Um, uh, but I would say that exhibiting in great patience, he let us all descend upon his house and upset his relatively quiet home life um, every single year, at least once and often more than once. He, he, um, he went camping with us in California's parks. He, he made sure that we had time, lots of time with extended family. And he made sure that, or he offered all of my kids an opportunity to attend and participate in Camp Elmwood, which they did. Um, and, and he just made us, everyone feel that they had a second home here in Berkeley uh, on Benvenue in, in, in his house and, and in this community. So we, we all feel incredibly connected um, because of the way his patience um, in you know, helping me come home at the right time uh, and, and being com very comfortable here. So I just, I'm so grateful that I and all of my family were able to spend so many years with him and enjoy his presence with us in so many different ways as, as we all walked together through the different um, parts of our life. And I just really treasure that. Um, and I, I, I am very happy to have you here all to help us remember him today. Thank you.
Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the fields, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So if you're like me, uh, you've thought of another five or 10 stories that could possibly be told. I thought the first person, first character I thought of for Wizard of Oz was a scarecrow because, well, he was kind of the most likable one um, and just nice to everybody. Um, but at St. John's, Fred was the wizard the Wizard of Oz here at St. John's, the guy that behind the scenes was doing all sorts of things. He was out front, but, you know, that was the tip of the iceberg. 2003, I just got here, and it wasn't very long. Um, I found that I was in a strong conversation with Marietta, and you might call it an argument. I can't remember what the issue was, but I just remember feeling anxious afterwards because the first church I served, if you, if, if one of the matriarchs got upset over something, they talked to some other people who talked to some other people, and pretty soon it was a full-blown across-the-church crisis. Now, I didn't really know Marietta, and I didn't know Fred really either. And you know, I'm thinking, okay, I, uh, Fred's the chair of the personnel committee. Uh, he's a ruling elder. I'm a teaching elder. Uh, Uh-oh, this is going to be a big deal. So we get to the meeting, and we just start out normal agenda going along. And, and the issue with Marietta doesn't come up at all. And so it gets to the time where I'm kind of, you know, what's going on, Max? And, and so I kind of don't, I don't want to hide from anything. And so I go ahead and kind of make a brief summary. And then I sat there anxiously waiting for what would happen next. Fred said, well, we have some pretty good conversations around here and people don't always agree. That was it. We moved on. I mean, the whole thing was like a minute or two at the most. As Jesus mentioned in his Sermon on the Mount, and which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to your lifespan? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. I went home that night thinking, wow, that was reasonable. I couldn't believe that there wasn't gossip that had blown up. It was so pleasant, so nice. St. John's would be, would be a place that didn't blow things out of proportion. And people can have strong conversations and be better for it. Something we can remember today. And Marietta would soon become one of my favorite people to discuss and argue with. She was one of the most intuitive people I've ever met. Intuitive people who are quick to speak can either be super insightful or way off. 
And I learned with Marietta, if the shoe fits, wear it. If she's off, let it go. She will. If she was on, take it to heart. I learned to love Marietta's feedback. I, I was, I, I, sometimes she was really, really helpful. And when she wasn't, it was like, okay, all right. From that early encounter, I would go on from there to, to spend maybe three to six hours on average in a given week for 15 years with Fred. I would learn a great deal more from him. Not that I would have guessed it from my first impression of him. A bit short, and at 70, 75, a slightly slow, a little bit scarecrowish. He tended to look a bit old fashioned and disheveled in his clothes. He drove an old small car. You wouldn't have guessed from right, right away that he was a lawyer. Materialism and outward show were not his concern. His office was a total mess. He was usually slow to speak and offered few words. He was very similar to one of my very favorite TV characters, Detective Columbo. It was very easy to underestimate him. But when it came to comic, a complicated issue, Fred had an, a remarkable ability to narrow things down to the key ingredients and to address them. He was never afraid of difficult tasks. Fred rarely started conversation. He was rarely the first words in the conversation. He was often the last word. I had seen maybe four or five different vacation Bible schools at various churches, but that didn't prepare me for Camp Elmwood. In comparison to the other camps I had seen, my first impression that it was that it was total chaos. The parents and other adults would be worried and, uh, and, and about something or another, and Fred would give him that super short response, yeah, yeah, remember that, yeah, 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 that he has is just really common to for him. Yeah, yeah, there'll be food. It'll work out, you know, like, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. And the same went for Christmas pageants. And he all went in and you know, had the incredible, uh, amazingly dependable team of Kathy Pratt and Don Rising. Camp after camp, pageant after pageant. In the first year, it was the first year I, I came in to watch the rehearsals. My kids were, you know, in the, in the mix, you know. So I'd like, you know, I'll go in there and I'm the pastor and I'm a dad. And, and it's like, man, that was the last time I did that. And then I also was like, you know, I like stop parents at the door. It's like, you don't want to go in there. <laughs> <laughs> it'll drive you crazy because it was like you know I had you know parents the second year I was not going in second year I had a couple parents come out and start saying you know they were all concerned about this or that and this and that I said you know what just come out here with me every year it would play out like Charlie Brown's Christmas it would look like it was going to be a total disaster and it would turn out wonderful Fred had this philosophy that kids would learn best by trial and error, so that whatever happened may not be the tightest, cleanest possible result, but it would be fun, it would be beautiful, and the kids would take ownership and learn, even from mistakes. He would bend over backwards to make sure that every single child and anybody else that, how, that felt like they wanted or needed to be in the pageant was in it. There are so many examples, but I'll just give you one. One year, a young boy didn't like any, he didn't like the idea of wearing these ancient Middle Eastern costumes 
and was not going to participate if he had to. But the child had this recent fascination with penguins and had bought a penguin suit for Halloween. So Fred wrote a penguin into the script of the birth of Jesus. And he was a star of the show. Don't be anxious about your, what you're going to wear. Look at the penguins. They don't worry, and they even have a tuxedo. Another part of Fred's philosophy shaped the culture of St. John's and Camp Elmwood, his theology. For God, for Fred, God was found in two things. God is our highest ideal, ethics lived rightly. And two, God is found in community. His theology wasn't much deeper than that. In, theology, in seminary, we, we might call that a horizontal theology. Let the children come. Be gracious, especially when learning. Don't let anxiety make things bigger than they are. Stay focused on the practical steps. Hold up the ethical life. Value community. The church, for Fred, was a group of people committed to living an ethical life like Jesus in service to the broader community. That's it. Now, as a pastor at a memorial service, my job is not to just prop up a person's life so they look good enough so that we'll all vote them into heaven. Though Fred might get more votes than almost anyone. Fred's salvation does not depend on how great and per perfect we make him look this afternoon. But more, maybe even more importantly for us, who may not measure up to where Fred's stature, what hope is there for us? For his death reminds us we too are mortal. When we lose someone, we don't just grieve because of the good we lose, we grieve also because of the weaknesses we have not overcome. No matter who we are, we all fall short of the glory of God. We're, we are all fallible and finite. It doesn't matter whether we have a horizontal or a vertical theology, we still need grace. It doesn't matter if you're Theology is so horizontal that you don't even believe in God. You still need grace. And nowhere, no, no more, nowhere more do we need it than when we face that final act of our pageant, that is death. Are we forgiven? Are we the grieving forgiven for our mixed opinions, our mixed relationship, our for what was left unfinished and unresolved, for anxiety, for anger. Was there any in there in Fred? Was he forgiven for that? Is he free? Are you free? Are we free to express those real feelings too? What about those who insist on some boundaries or Recognize that sometimes peace needs to be disturbed. That in a healthy place filled with grace, we are free to express even the more difficult, more negative emotions. When our dad, our mentor, our elder taught us to be positive and happy, is it okay to tap into sadness when we lose him? God's love can handle all of us, all parts of us, all of our emotions. Even those parts that have been closed off or opened up by the difficulties of life. And if Easter, Easter means anything, it means that grace outlives even death. Death does not have the last word. Love never ends. Now, if there's a sign of grace in Fred's life, it was Marietta. 
How beautifully did they sit on the opposite sides of the personality teeter-totter and balance each other out. It worked amazingly well to the degree that we can see the result in these amazing kids and grandkids and cousins and nieces and nephews and the whole Harvey clan. And of course, this church reflects Fred in a profound, <clears throat> profound way. It has been one of the true great honors of my life and joys of my life to learn and work alongside Fred. And I believe that his soul has not gone to the dust but now becomes one with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of all life, inside of us too, inspiring us to live a life that nurtures hope and confidence in children, resolves conflict, upholds ethical living in community. Dear God, may it be so. Amen. So now we'll stand and sing hymn number 464, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You Thee. And the final verse is printed in the bulletin. So you want to have that handy. bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, Spirit of life, we thank you and praise you for the gifts of life, for our ability 
to be conscious and share love and community. We ask for your comfort and grace as we express the full range of feelings you have made available to us, especially as we honor and say goodbye to a wonderful saint, father, brother, grandfather, friend, uncle, mentor, Fred Harvey. We thank you for the love and joy we have shared. We thank you for your forgiveness for all that he and we should not have been done but did and for what we should have done and didn't. We praise you for the hope and faith that he has been welcomed somewhere over the rainbow just as he is in your loving arms and into the great camp heaven where all your children are welcomed, joyous and whole. Guide us who continue on, especially Ruth, Daniel, Bill, and all the children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, and sister. May we continue this work of Fred to promote joy, peace, and community in the world. By your grace, now and forever, amen. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Fred. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into your loving arms, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. Thank you.